nice people. Ah, my office. The perfect office. Perspex desk, no in tray, no out tray, no phone, no filing cabinets, no clutter. Quiet, cool, very efficient. I need never get out of this chair. That'll be nice. No distractions. Just me and the work. Alone and efficient. Alone. Wonder if anybody wants me. Nobody to ask. Messages. Well, BJ39 will know. After all, it works for me. I don't even have to go to it. Much better than a human being. Tireless and efficient. Anything I want, it brings. Even company. I'm just off to New York. Before I go, don't get Charlie. Fine. Well, recorded company anyway. Charlie. Of course, I could have taken it round to Charlie's office myself. But, well, the, the photograph's just as good. Anyway, old BJ will take it to him. Several copies. I wonder if it ever bumps into anything. Certainly free to get a lot of work done with no human distractions. Just me and my executive prism. It relaxes me. It relaxes me. It relaxes me. Ah, well. Letter. Funny how fast you get down to work when you're alone. I mean, really alone. Uh, take a letter, Miss Smith, to Mr. Charles Durrant. Uh, dear Durrant, dear Miss uh, Smith, to me. wherever you are, you always were late, inefficient, talkative. <laughs> I must have threatened to fire you a dozen times. No more of that nonsense now. I'm an automated executive. Even the coffee's automatic. Go away. See, it goes away. Quietly, efficiently. The great thing about machines is that they do what they're told. They leave you to get on with it. Never late, they're obedient, they're never sick, they never disturb you, or argue, or paint their nails, or talk, or smile at you, or say good morning, or keep you company. They just leave you alone. They leave you alone. Main Street in the American mining township of Leed. Nearly a hundred years ago, Calamity Jane and Wild Bill Hickok shot it out here with other desperados during the gold rush. The gunmen lie buried in the nearby hills. The gold they fought over has gone from the surface. So have the quick fortune seekers who cream nuggets from the topsoil. Today, the mining is a serious professional business carried out deep under the ground in the biggest gold mine in the Western Hemisphere. Raymond Davis, a New York chemist, comes to the mine to collect something more precious than gold. He gathers information about the sun. Davis and his assistant make this journey every three months to their underground laboratory. Here, a mile underground, nothing penetrates the gloom. No sunlight, no X-rays from the sun. Not even cosmic rays can probe this far into the Earth. Nothing at all penetrates the shield of rock, except particles coming from the very center of the sun. 
These particles are called neutrinos. Invisible, ghost-like, they waft through the Earth to be trapped by Davis and his assistant. And this is the trap that Davis uses to catch the neutrinos. It holds 100,000 gallons of chlorine dry-cleaning fluid. As the neutrinos pass through the liquid, a few of them latch on to the chlorine atoms. The tank is buried down here because other rays can't penetrate to this depth. Even then, the neutrinos remain tantalizingly difficult to catch. On average, only one neutrino is captured in this tank every two days. In three months, Davis harvests less than 50 neutrinos. He sifts through the tank's contents for atoms of chlorine which have stopped neutrinos. The interaction between the chlorine and the neutrinos produces a form of argon, a radioactive gas. It's the argon atoms which tell Davis how hot the sun is at its core. To assess the findings of this unique thermometer is a long and complicated business. A trap cooled with liquid air is part of the system for collecting the atoms of argon. Helium gas roars through the tank, sweeping out any traces of argon. When the jet of helium gas carrying the argon atoms reaches the laboratory, this cold trap freezes out any vapour which is mixed with the gas. It's the first stage in purifying the argon. It takes a week for the cold traps to collect and purify it. Now it's released from the last trap. Pressure of mercury shunts the gas through the network of pipes and at the end of it all is a little purified argon gas from the huge tank. The gas holds a few radioactive atoms containing neutrinos. Later the radioactivity will be measured by Davis in his New York laboratory. Already they've given one important answer to astronomers and that is that the sun could be at least a million degrees cooler than anybody thought. The whole area, consisting of 35 separate lights, is built up on a single chip of gallium arsenide crystal no thicker than a razor blade. The crystals are grown out of a molten pool. Each one takes five hours to make and at full size will be about three inches long. They're worth about a hundred pounds each and at that price need to be handled with care. The crystal is cleaned and then mounted in wax, ready for slicing into chips. Here too, great care must be taken to ensure that the cuts are exactly in line with the structure of the crystal. A test chip is always taken to be checked by X-ray. From these measurements, exact adjustments can be made to the plane in which the crystal is to be cut. The test piece is bombarded with X-rays, which are reflected by the internal structure of the crystal into a Geiger counter. From this, you can calculate the exact direction in which the grain of the crystal lies. Then these measurements are used to adjust a circular saw and the crystal is ready to be sliced up. After each piece is polished on both sides to a mirror finish, it's ready to be turned into a form of transistor circuit. A layer of phosphide is built up on the polished surface by exposing the chip to a mixture of hot gases. It's a delicate process, it's taken three years to develop, and even now, half the chips fail to build up properly. Those that do succeed are cleaned and coated with a thin layer of silica. How they do this is still a closely guarded secret. Then a few drops of photosensitive liquid are put on the surface, and the chip is spun at high speed. Once the liquid is spread evenly, the chip is dried in an oven at 100 degrees centigrade. A 
it's then etched by a conventional photolithographic technique. First, the photosensitive surface is exposed to ultraviolet light. It will make it quite hard and resistant to the etching acid. Windows are made in the surface by covering the chip with a mask. And it's these squares from which the lights will shine on the finished crystal. It's accurately lined up and the ultraviolet light is switched on. The areas covered by the mask won't be affected by the light. When the chip is removed and sprayed with a developing fluid, the masked areas will be washed clean. The chip now has 35 accurately placed windows and it's within these spaces that the filaments of the light will be made. But first the whole crystal is immersed in acid which removes the silica still covering the windows. The windows can now be turned into active filaments by diffusing zinc into them. Small pieces of arsenic and zinc are put with the chip into a glass tube. All air and moisture are pumped out and the end sealed off with an acetylene torch. The seal must be perfect. The glass pellet is put into an oven and heated to 800 degrees centigrade. At this temperature, the little pieces of zinc and arsenic will vaporize and saturate the surfaces of the windows. The finished chip, blackened by heat, has to be cleaned before the rest of the circuitry can be added. This process covers one side of the chip with zinc. A similar process covers the other side with gold. These metals form the electric contacts and the actual circuit paths are etched out in the same way as the windows were made. The connecting wires that complete the circuitry are finer than silk. The windows will now glow when a current is passed through them. They can be switched on and off almost instantaneously and they're practically unbreakable. Within the next five years, these crystal lights could become the standard method of instrumentation display on anything from a computer to a spacecraft. Only one display would be needed. A pilot or computer operator would simply press a button and the relevant information would be displayed on an array of crystal lights. One small bank of these lights could replace all the instrumentation on the flight deck of the Concorde. But so far only four have been made and at the moment they're expensive. But in a few years time this numerical method of displaying information could become as familiar as the speedometer on the dashboard of a car.